All right, our next session uh, will be held by Price Waterhouse Coopers, Jeffrey T. Hunter, Principal Advanced Risk and Compliance Analyst. And his presentation is titled, Breaking the Rules, Transforming Transaction Monitoring Through Analytics. So as stated, I'm in the Risk Analytics Group for PwC. That doesn't mean that's all I've ever done in my life. I actually started out on a trading floor as an equity trader back in the early 90s, so I'm probably older than most people in the room. And I have migrated from managing traders to managing technologists to now managing mathematicians. I've looked at the facets from all uh, angles of the financial services world, front, middle, and back office. Background-wise, I'm kind of a strange breed, a degree in sensory perception psychology, an MBA in global finance, and a master's in applied mathematics for fractal geometry and behavioral modeling. So I can give you a test on any of those. So if you want to do a math test and you fail, you have to leave. That's all there is to it. No, but um, how many people here work in financial services, just so I can get an idea of the audience? Okay, not a lot. How many people have a bank account? <laughs> how many people think you're going to be involved in an anti-money laundering terrorist financing scam? <laughs> Everyone can raise your hand, and that's the scary part about it. So I'm not going to read you the regulations, but what we want to talk about is how data and analytics has moved in the banks from what they do with the fun, sexy stuff, which is online trading, algorithmic trading, high-frequency trading, quantitative risk, to where now it's moving further and further, let's call it, into the back room, to where they're using it, as the Siemens example showed, where they're starting to use it for internal audit. They're starting to use it for operational analytics. They're starting to use it for things for compliance and regulations. Because the regulations are changing so fast, the regulations are diving even deeper, and the reason that you need a tool that can help you with your data and analytics capabilities for this is because the only way to keep pace is to start to apply what people used to do and apply math and machines so that they can help either support it, augment it, or advance it. So I'm not going to read you the entire regulation, but this is the perfect example. It's local. It's New York City. Uh, after 9-11, we came up with a lot of rules based off the Patriot Act and Sarbanes-Oxley and various other things. But one of the greatest things we started to do was we wanted to follow the money. Uh, the regulators wanted to find a way to break money laundering and also to break money laundering from the standpoint of how it affected terrorist financing. There were very large uh, overarching rules that were put in place to help the United States government protect itself and then also a worldwide community agreed on how to do it. What I'm showing you now is what New York has decided to do on their own, which we feel is very progressive. We as patriots think it's the right thing to do. But what they're doing is they're starting to push the responsibility for anti-money laundering and illicit transactions further and further down the chain to where they need to be audited on a more granular level. Before, they used to do very broad sweeping tests. Uh, it was easy for us to go out and build transaction monitoring systems to help them fix those things. But now in the example that New York State's starting to do, they're pushing it further down in the granularity of the transactions they want to look at, the frequency they want to look at, as well as what they want the people who run those banks he or she to sign off on those things in a much more granular level. So it's getting scarier not only for what we're trying to find using data analytics, but more importantly how we attest to what's going on inside that institution so the CEO and CFO can sign off and simply say, we are compliant. Now, based off of the tone of how everything else is going, I'm not going to go into a great deal of the next few slides. I'll get more into the process and the math quiz, but so we can talk about what we're starting to do. But very quickly, in anti-money laundering, which is a very non-sexy thing to say at times, unless you're really involved in it, and it's actually doing very good things. But what we're trying to explain to you is that it is truly starting to accelerate at a pace to where we as individuals and where the banks are very concerned on how they're going to start to look at it. What they've done historically, they've always used what's called transaction monitoring systems. Those systems are basically rules-based systems. A lot of third parties provide them, we use and we install a lot of them for them. But what they do is they create a very static rules-based environment for monitoring data and helping to find the appropriate output. Now yes, they do serve a purpose, they still are used every day, but they're starting to get to where the need to move to a more dynamic, more real-time, more evolutionary way of managing these data inputs, which simply are the transactions, that they're starting to find a way to change that. Um, I'm obviously standing in this conference for a reason, because we're starting to use this same rapid minor capability to help move and advance transaction monitoring systems. As the slide says, the existing model is inefficient, it's costly, and it's also time, uh, the, the timeliness of it 
not only from the standpoint of putting it in, but its response back is starting to become to where it's arbitrary. Traditionally, in the data sets of what we look at for transaction monitoring systems are the same data sets we're going to use with a tool like RapidMiner to help us get a better understanding of the data and start to model that data so that we can be more evolutionary in real time versus rules-based and static. You know, going into everything that you see here, the political, law enforcement, economic, social, media, we look at everything. And the ability to be able to expand the data sets we put into these transaction monitoring systems allows us to be more effective. Again, I don't want to read you all the slides. I want to get to the last two based off of how we've been doing these things. But fundamentally, if you talk to any chief compliance officer, chief risk officer, or executive that runs a financial institution in the world, they flat out are overwhelmed. Transaction volume is increasing at a pace that is ridiculous. The ability to go from a mobile phone to what is now an audited financial record, uh, the steps in between are starting to scare them greatly. So the transactions are not only uh, multiplying. So the veracity of data is getting to a point where they can't handle it. The velocity of data is at a pace to where they can't handle it. And the volume, we all know the issue around volume. So they're all having these problems and looking for much more creative and scientific ways to solve these problems. In the old days, transaction monitoring, again, not a sexy term unless you're about to be the one to be sued for illicit financing. Um, as I said, use very rules-based static systems for monitoring data. We, you know, we set the thresholds, we start to tune the thresholds, we create risk scoring for those activities, and then we try to help put, give output to those people that are necessary to go out and manually look at those things that surpass the threshold that could be of risk. Now, there are different ways to look at this whole paradigm, and I'm not gonna go through the statistical modeling because that's not relevant. So we've heard the phrases correlation, clustering, and classification. Uh, in data mining and as a data scientist, those are kind of be the three main staples of what you're gonna look at. And when a transaction monitoring system, they're simply looking for the basis of correlation or classification of transactions that fit those thresholds and give us a scare. Again, not too sexy, and I'm gonna skip through this. We can talk about how you can start to model that instead of doing a rules base. The model means that if you have all these rules in place, you have access to the data, if you marry the two in a real-time way, you can start to model the rules versus just using the rules for output. Meaning, how do you let the machine continuously run and find everything that might hit a threshold if other variables were applied to it? Basic sensitivity analysis, regression statistical analysis, meaning if the machine could adapt on the fly, basically saying a transaction that comes from this location and a transaction that comes from a different location can't be deemed the same transaction because one might have a different profile to the customer, the location it's coming from, the type of transaction, the merchant, whatever it might be. And it's very hard to build all the rules for all those variables, but you can build a model to help you manage those variables. So the old way, rules-based. Static, limited, subjective. It's very reliant on, sorry, mathematicians refer to people as qualitative variables. <laughs> uh, it's very reliant on qualitative variables. Now, in a modeled base, we can start to get more to where we can be, be more, di more dynamic, more extensible models, be much more effective at helping the banks adhere to the compliance and regulations which they were given which I think is a very sexy thing, and hence the reason I've moved from a trading floor into the middle office compliance function to help them start to apply math and machine. So, how do we solve that problem? This as PwC, and this is myself as a data scientist for the last 20 plus years, this is simply how you start to look at this problem. For every one of you in the room that's tasked with helping your business advance itself and how they use math and machine to help solving problems. Again, I don't care if it's algorithmic trading, I don't care if it's, you know, as we said, the A-B testing for ad placement, to such. You start to go through in a methodical way to solve these problems. Obviously, is what we talk about first is to define the objectives and levers. For us, in this case, it's very easy. Regulations defines those objectives and levers. We're told what the government expects these institutions to do. Well, the institutions now have a hypothesis on those objectives and levers is that they can't do it the way they do it today. It's impossible. The volume just doesn't allow for them to do that. So again, you as qualitative variables sometimes slow down that process, sometimes create error, sometimes create bias, whatever it might be. And then we simply move through the paradigm of what's necessary. And again, falling in concert with what we've talked about already today, you'll see that there's always two components to solving a riddle like this. 
There's the data component, there's the analytics component. Uh, and every data scientist in the world, even the ones who spoke today, will tell you one thing. I can solve that problem if you give me the data. Now the key to getting the data is how do you get the data into a usable state? How do you start to manipulate it? Not manipulate it to change it, but manipulate it to create a product that's necessary to power the algorithm you're hoping to do. And that's where you know, it starts to get tricky because we used to do it the old fashioned way of pulling it down, looking at it, playing with it, whatever we did. But then as you start to move through the value chain of this process is the data prep and selection and cleansing. Again, it starts to become a very tedious process, but again, it's absolutely necessary for model validation and model output. But then we get into the fun part, so the modeling design and implementing the piece. And again, we as PwC look at this process for any type of hypothesis we're given. If we are asked by a chief marketing officer, a chief risk officer, a chief financial officer, we're still going to dissect the problem the same way. Then we start to simulate and optimize and see if it actually works. And we continuously test and retest and, and try to break it. Again, using the ability to go back and get the data, put the data into a new product, model it, optimize it, and see if it works. And when we finally reach success, that's when we'll deploy it to system, to where we make it part of an SAP BPC system if it's something for a CFO. That will embed it into a transaction monitoring if it's for compliance. Or build it into a digital presence because it's a new way to do ad placement or next best pricing or recommendations, whatever it might be. Again, we all look at it in the same way. Well, the reason I'm standing here is because we actually work with Rapid Miner to make that very arcane process in a way to automate it in a little bit further fashion. So the, the marriage between PwC and RapidMiner comes from this is, I took this directly from RapidMiner's data science presentation. To me as a data scientist, I put it up here because I think it's right and it works. And it simply puts our model into a different place. So if I put the two together, this is how we now start to attack these problems. This is how you can start to attack these problems. Obviously, if we look at the first step to define the objectives and levers, that's not where Rapid Miner or a company like them is going to come into place. That's where you come in as the qualitative expert because qualitative expertise and qualitative intuition is always needed for any of these to be successful because a machine is never going to tell you how to run your business and how to measure it's going to be best. But if you look at the rest of how we start to solve these problems for our customers, Rapid Miner Studio gives us the ability to automate this in a way and also make it a lot more repeatable so we can get to better success because if the process can be more continuous or have the same methodology that you go through, you have better understanding that the output is going to be defensible. And that's how we look at it. So if we start to dissect the PwC process and look at it against the rapid miner process, we see the fact that we have the ability to prep the data. They have the tool sets for us to bring various numerous and very painful data sets into a single environment. And we can start to manipulate them through the data science process, as you've heard before, correlation, classification, and clustering. We can do the base relationship of the data. That's very important to use because the prep data sometimes people think is just the necessary step to jump into the fun stuff. Well, I think the gentleman right before me just spoke about it also. When you get the data together and you start to prep the data and analyze the data, the data will tell you the strings to pull on yourself. Meaning the correlation, the clustering, and the classification of the data when it starts to coalesce itself together will tell you where you should start to look. It'll give you clues. Uh, and it's very interesting because data is data, but mathematically it'll start to clump itself together, right? The next one is where we start to model. We used to do it the old fashioned way. We used to program in Fortran, COBOL, C, C++. We did the old things. Again, I'm older than most people in this room. JavaScript was not a leisure for us back in the early days, but now it's started to evolve. Um, but the fact that we can start to utilize things such as Python and R directly inside of the RapidMiner Studio helps us to achieve these capabilities. Again, in this case for transaction monitoring, to where we can start to apply, I hate to say next generation tools, does, does anybody know how old Python is? Okay, it's 26 years old this year, but it just became popular in the last two years because it's a very good mathematical driven means of, of doing computation. So, but having Python and R and our ability to use within this single environment helps us to also speed up the process. I'll admit it, we're consultants, and sometimes when we can find a tool like this to speed up the process, 
It's not great for us, but the customers really, really like it because it means less billable time. And then obviously moving through what's going on, the ability to then validate those models because we want to make sure that our output is helping us to measure and achieve the results we were hoping to in that initial first phase to define the objectives and levers. And then finally, the ability then to deploy that to system. It allows us to containerize it and help us put it into whatever the ERP platform custom application might be to where we start to make that output a function of the system they're used to looking at. Uh, let's be very honest, I fall into the same criteria that it doesn't matter how good the data is, it doesn't matter how great the model is, they don't want to hear if it's Bayesian, cognitive, fractile, or whatever it might be. They want to see a pretty chart at the end of the day that gives them the output and gives them optionality of what they should do. And that's the deploy to system. So never, even as mathematicians, we're not allowed to downplay the visualization effort of those data. But this is where we start to help our customers start to advance themselves because it's the people in the back office and middle office that do all the work, in my opinion. <laughs> but it's the output that's given to the front office that allows for decisions to be made on investments and people and things to that nature. So I just, like I said, I wanted to, to scoot through the first part because I don't think anyone wanted me to read you the new regulations on anti-money laundering as stated by New York. Uh, so, but I wanted to show you what we as data scientists do, oops, do to help our customers start to test any hypothesis there might be. And again, as I said, this is a process and this is the Rapid Miner tool is a way that we can go through. And as, as I said, if, they, if it's customer retention down to internal audit to verify SAS 99 data compliance for a financial audit, we use the same process and the same type of tools to build this for our customers. So with that said, I already covered a great deal of the points of why the, the marriage between ourselves and what we do with Rapid Miner works quite well. Um, so, but I wanted to try to end a little bit earlier just in case there are some questions about either our use of the Rapid Miner tool, the process itself, what it's like to be, I guess, um, what they refer to as a data scientist, uh, and what I've done over the past 20 years. Questions? So it's, yeah, so the question was about are we replacing uh, transaction-based tools such as Actimize or things to that nature? The answer is no. We don't want to replace the transaction systems because what they do is provide us a baseline of data access and data output. So in the paradigm of what um, analytics really is, that first phase is what's called descriptive analytics. It allows us to know what we know and you know historically what has happened. The transaction monitoring systems are very good at that, and that they still provide a useful output for a starting point. But as you start to move through the paradigm from descriptive analytics of what do we know into predictive analytics is what will happen, and then moving further up the value chain into prescriptive analytics, which is what will happen, what can we do, which is where the power of rapid mining really starts to help us, and then evolving into machine learning and artificial intelligence. So I would not say no. We're not trying to ever replace people or systems, we're just trying to make them a tad more effective and also the ability to handle things in a more timely, real-time fashion. Any other questions? I have three minutes. I will give a math quiz. No? Yes. Oh, right here? Well, somebody was yeah, so probably the best way to think about how a model-based system in money laundering can help is its ability to do if-then scenarios. So in the terms of mathematics, Bayesian logic, uh, which is a fundamental basis of a lot of how uh, models are built. So a Bayesian methodology or a Bayesian algorithm would simply look at if-then scenarios. But it has the ability to look at if-then scenarios ad infinitum, meaning it can do it real time, it can ask its own question, that question creates another question, creates another if-then scenario, and then you move through that capability. So in this case, for the regulatory environments, what we start to look at in the money laundering piece is, the first question is, is this a legal transaction or not? Meaning, does it come from a viable source and then both sides of the T account are accounted for so that we can say yes or no. If it's not or if there's question to it, it then starts to ask the other questions. It'll go into the various capabilities of the transaction, where it started, who did it, is it normal size, things of that nature. And it can constantly, the model can start to ask the if-then questions all the way down to final output. There's a lot of times in the if-then scenario for money laundering compliance that an account might show up 
the branch manager, the, the account owner or something might send it to the compliance officer to say, wait a minute, this has a flag on it because if this type of transaction shows up, I'm supposed to send it to you compliance so that then you can tell me if I proceed with this client or not. Using a modeling-based technique, you could start to model what that compliance manager does at the branch level and then what they do at a regional level and then the oversight of the chief compliance officer, what he or she answers and says, you start to use that as let's call it new knowledge for the algorithm, a cognitive algorithm to use, so it starts to make those decisions itself. Because it might not make it the first time, but when it sees the same answer five times in a row, it's going to adapt itself to say, I already know the answer to this, I'm gonna answer the question myself, I'm gonna to move to the next layer of Bayesian uh, interpretation and ask the next layer of if-then equations. So it simply allows you to start to build uh, decision modeling into a more rapid fashion. Does that answer your question? So that's really hard. So my answer there is we haven't got there yet because the whole concept of money laundering happens because people are nefarious. If you're going to go in and build an account or build multiple accounts to try to do money laundering, the problem is it starts with, again, I apologize that I call people qualitative elements, it starts with a person filling out a form. Every one of you in the room has filled out what's known as a KYC form, know your customer meaning that the government mandates you have to have specific information with specific verification and then start to surveil that information so that it's correct. Where our technology is going to advance to, in my opinion, is we will be able to get to the point where we'll stop money laundering before they build the account. Meaning why trust a person who's nefarious in nature to give you false information, false documentation, to do whatever it takes to get that account open. Because if you gave me your name and social security number, and Please don't. But if you gave me those today, using analytics and what's referred to as deep web intelligence, because only 2% of the world's internet is actually indexed, um, we can go out and start to build those forms for you. So you never have a chance in the beginning to put in the nefarious information. Um, I did work in a stint in the intelligence agency, so I do apologize. But to put it best, if you're starting to use modeling for these type of activities, uh, in the intelligence agencies, we always looked at it two ways. There's bad behavior and good behavior. You always start modeling the good behavior first. Good. People who are good are repeatable. They do the same things. It's easy to model good behavior and then eliminate them from your surveillance program. Start to look at the bad only. Any other questions? Yeah, I have one, one last question. Very oh, good. Yeah, you, you supported my theory also. So I like <laughs> you. Uh, very, very good presentation. I, just, I was just wondering uh, how are you using the text analytics into your, and how is Rapid Miner? Are you using the A alien um, uh, Combination. extension? Or, yeah. So Thank text you. analytics we're still doing on our own in a, a way that we think is natural language processing in our own way. But what we do is we use that as a new output that we would put into a Rapid Miner model. So we still are doing NLP in a different way. So natural language processing is one of the best ways to do text analytics. There's a lot of other ways. But we simply are starting to use the output from textual analytics. So link analysis to just clustering of certain keywords, whatever it might be. And we use that as an output into our, into our model or a variable for our model. Does that answer your question? OK. Like pre grime, what um, you, you mentioned that you wanted to like detect money laundering before it happens, right? Isn't that like pre crime? Like you're, you're kind of convicting somebody, so it's not pre crime, it's just basically cool. putting in a gate that's using data and analytical models so that you can't start the process. Uh, an illegal or illicit transaction has right, but they to have it, they haven't even started the process yet. How do you know it's the illegal? process of an illicit transaction is the person providing information to open the account? That still stands today. You'd be shocked how many banks in the world, including in North America, still use a written faxed form to start the account opening process. There are a lot of places in the world, especially Middle East, Central America, Africa, that still use sometimes where somebody calls them, gives them the information over the phone, the person at the branch will fill out that form for them and then submit it through the KYC AML process. That's the process to where you have the biggest point of failure. So I'm not trying to get to pre-crime to identify them before they commit. We're trying to take away what is the qualitative step and turn it into a quantitative step 
so that they can't start the nefarious process that early. Because okay, once so, they're inside so the bank, during, they'll find during it. During the, the know your customer process? Yes. Okay, that's when you stop. Yep. Okay. Cause I, th I thought you wanted to just like flag people and they won't even be able to fill Never them. flag people. I would, I would, yeah, no, I'm not Donald Trump. So <laughs> we don't want to flag, we don't want to flag them, but what we want to do is make sure that the information that they're putting on that form is the accurate information based off what's publicly available in social media and other transaction history. Okay. Oh. Then isn't the logical next step for the nefarious individuals just to particularly just go into identity theft and use all of our identities to, sp to basically so, mess you up? <laughs> it's a great question and that's exactly what they do. So identity theft is probably the biggest use for the creation of an account that will eventually be used for some type of illicit financing. Uh, and that's, that's the major issue. But then there's ways around that. Yes? As uh, one of your uh, previous answers, you mentioned that you'd eliminate a qualitative step and qu make it quantitative. Now, if you were to apply this to treatment of patients in healthcare, essentially everything is qualitative, more or less. Correct. So how would you actually tackle uh, a qualitative process where a, f uh, where a physician yep. or somebody looks at and completely eliminate and make quantitative. So I'll answer this quickly because we're running out of time. Um, first, find me on LinkedIn and I'll send you a different presentation because I never believe in the complete elimination of qualitative resources. Very quickly in what's called quantitative disruption, there's four stages. Pre-disruption, disruption, overshoot, and synthesize. Pre-disruption is where we have this concept of what we want to do. Disruption is when we actually apply the model and the data to disrupt how that business process was done. Then there's that overshoot phase, which means that I've let the machine start to make all my decisions, and a machine is never going to make the decisions with the proper, let's call it moral fortitude that a person might do. And most companies see that, and it, it, it happens. NSA telephone surveillance program is the best example of it. They let the machine determine what they were going to surveil on every communications that went in the United States. That's wrong because it didn't state you don't need to look at these people, these people, there's reasons and such that. So then you get which is synthesis, which means that you find the proper balance of qualitative interpretation of a quantitative output. So I'm never saying get rid of all people because then I wouldn't have a job. But what I'm saying is that every action is a ratio of partly qualitative and partly quantitative. If that ratio is 100% qualitative and zero quantitative, I, I disagree with that. But if it's ever zero qualitative and 100% quantitative, I really disagree with that because you should always have qualitative interpretation to the output of a machine. Because the cognitive thinking of a machine, just so you know, even Watson has the same cognitive ability to make moral decisions as the same level as a fourth grader which I don't think we want our banks making decisions with machines at the level of a fourth grader, because I see what my sixth grader does with money, and I'm screwed. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic.